you are standing on the back of the wall in Ease Against Fire Code, we would really appreciate you finding a seat. If anybody who has an empty seat next to them can raise their hand, that would be wonderful. <laughs> if we could also take this opportunity and set our so our phones to silent, that would be great. That's an important thing. Or to a palm storm ringtone. We would also like to kindly remind you that flash photography is prohibited, but feel free to take any normal flash. <laughs> All right, so let's face it. We have a pretty amazing author track this year, do we not? <laughs> we have become bigger and better than ever before. I do believe it has been joked that we have become author con, and we take that as a great badge of pride because we've been joined by some incredible talent, and we are so happy to have them here. And we're even more happy that they blessed us by coming here to let us do this little kickoff. So first and foremost, I would like to introduce a couple of wonderful people. They have a musical web series called Learning Town on Geek and Sundry. They've had music featured in Despicable Me 2, The Legend of Neil. My niece loves you guys. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I can show you the pictures of her maid. Be loving our nieces everywhere. <laughs> and a little show called The Guild. So if you guys would mind, join me in giving a round of applause to Paul and Storm. Sandeep Greek. Uh, we're just going to do, a, a, as is appropriate for all uh, books and authors' tracks, we're going to do a song. Uh, Sean, would you by any chance sort of function as a, as a guitar mic stand and point that in a general direction? <laughs> this is what you've been reduced to, Sean. High tech operation tonight, folks. So we're going to let the party this around this microphone. We're going to do uh, the song that is going to make all the people sitting up uh, at these tables really mad at us. Uh, but it comes from the heart. Uh, it probably comes from your heart as well. So if you like this song, and even if you don't, we're doing a concert uh, tomorrow night in yes. the Ballroom 120 along with Matt Rothfuss and John Scalzi. Sean McGuire will be there, and any other guests we can rope into doing a cameo. Uh, so this gives you a flavor of what you're about, we're about if you've never heard of us. George R. R. Martin, please write and write faster. You're not going to get any younger, you know. The winter is coming, I'm growing impatient. And you so got two old damn books left to go. So write, George, write like the wind. Yeah, it could be three at this point. <laughs> I curse the day that my friend ever loaned me an old dog-eared paperback called Game of Thrones. How could I know that the sea would grow me to an addiction that held me right down to my bones? Now five books later, I learn with the masses, indignant and titled and waiting for word that the Great Bearded Glacier has finally published 900 more pages of crack for the nerds. Why does every new verse of your song keep taking you so goddamn long? George R. R. Martin, please write and write faster. Please give us more letters. We need our allotment of incest and intrigue and six page descriptions of every last meal. So write, George, write like the wind. This took five years to chronicle Narnia. Tolkien had twelve years and Rowling took ten. Lucas spent nearly three decades on Star Wars and we all know how that one turned out in the end. You're not our bitch and you're not a machine and we don't mean to dictate how you spend your days. But please bear in mind in the time that you had, William Shakespeare churned out 35 freaking plays. And if you keep writing so slow, you'll hold up the HBO show. And George, while you're at it, 
stop killing our favorite characters, please. Is that right? George, right? Like the George R. R. Martin, please write and write fast. Die before you are dead, George. Please write like the wind. Okay, first, 
All right, who's next? Come on, guys. So this is my very first one. And I'm, I'm one of those people who hates the, the usual hotel convention, convention center air conditioning. I, I freeze very, very quickly. You know, so I'm wearing a sweater. You will see me in a sweater all weekend, and you'll think I'm crazy but it's because air conditioning freezes. So I actually go outside, and you know, in hot climates, it's really nice. I go outside, and, oh, you know, I'm finally warm for the first time all night. Except I've noticed here, I go out, and I have about two seconds of that nice, oh, it's warm. <laughs> Well, it's my first, uh, but certainly not my first time in Phoenix, and uh, I don't like the air conditioning. <laughs> it's my first as well, um, and I have to say, I just I'm looking with astonishment at all the cosplayers when they go outside. You sort of wonder. It feels like you, there should be a betting pool going on, like who's going to keel over. <laughs> Uh, I actually used to live in Phoenix when I was a kid, so I've healed over a few times here. Um, but it's my first Comic Con, actually, my second Comic Con overall, and my first one in Phoenix, obviously. So I'm a newbie, so treat me nicely, please. Uh, this is my first Phoenix Comic Con, and is this microphone important? No. Uh, this is my first Phoenix. Okay, there we go. Hello. Um, this is my first Phoenix Comic Con and my first time properly in Phoenix. I've been through Sky Harbor before, but that does not count. And uh, I'm, I'm from Minnesota, Wisconsin. Um, I, I make a snarky joke about the weather here, but it's humidity and mosquitoes carrying away small children up north, or you know, lead melting on the sidewalk down here. So take your pick. Having been in Minnesota, I think I'd even pick Phoenix. <laughs> Some days, yes. Some days, yes. I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area. It's been 80 degrees for the last three years. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all are nuts. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I'm with Scott, we kind of come from the same climb, and actually, I kind of like this weather, <laughs> as opposed to, like, you step outside and it suddenly feels like you've been wrapped in a hot towel. <laughs> um, but that said, I, I'm certainly not taking any long hikes here. Um, my first Phoenix Comic Con, I heard actually from John. John sold me on it, he says, he says, if you're not coming, then you're a chump because they really like their authors here and it's great to be an author at Phoenix. It really is. I mean, one of the things that really surprised me, because Comic Cons have finally figured out, hey, people write things with words and maybe the people who come to these things might actually occasionally read them and want to meet people. I know, it's a shock, right? <laughs> but, uh, but strangely enough, uh, Phoenix has been up on this one for, for a long time now, which, which makes me really happy. It's, it's like, I think this is the largest concentration of, of science fiction and fantasy writers outside of an actual, like, world con, which is, you know, where, all, where the Hugos go, and so it's kind of nerd concentrate. Um, so just the fact that it has so many actual writers here is actually very, very cool. And especially, like, these ones. Not him. Doesn't he look like a shampoo commercial? It really does. John stays up at night dreaming of chances to get me to do this on panel. <laughs> Silverberg uh, at one point said uh, that uh, one of the tr things that people don't know is there's an actual uh, uh, priesthood called the Scalzis. There's the, the Scalzi uh, uh, brothers, and uh, he always like, and there's John Scalzi cosplaying. <laughs> Very sad. I lost my hair at 22. I, I but at call. least I'm not Phil Plate. <laughs> Phil? Wow. Ouch. Phil's, Phil's here somewhere. Oh, he writes nonfiction. <laughs> I do have a follow-up question for uh, any or all of the authors. Uh, 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 Scalzi alluded to it. What is the scientific term for a collection of sci-fi and fantasy authors? And or uh, is there a different term for fantasy authors? A uh, shirking. A procrastination. A procrastination is all. Procrastination. It's a trilogy, right? <laughs> Trilogy of fantasy on <laughs>
what the ERA trilogy of things? <laughs> Except that it's never just three. Well, and the trilogy forever. Right yeah. uh, it's either many more than three or only two. <laughs> <laughs> we will be on stage together later. <laughs> Tell all these people in between us. I know that you were on quite a few panels yourselves. So far, what has been your favorite title for a panel you're either on or have heard of? Mm. <laughs> I, I, can, I can do this one off the cuff. It's the epic fantasy versus urban fantasy, where there is only one epic fantasy person <laughs> on the panel. This is a real versus. <laughs> this seems like it, it, that's an intervention. Patrick, have you counted the number of words on either side? <laughs> I did kind of want to get one of those balance arm scales and take like every, the first of everyone's you know urban fantasy series and try to see if at least it balanced that way. But I don't know. <laughs> Patrick, I remember. Uh, meeting your work for the first time because I was on tour and you left me a copy of your book. <laughs> and I go, I'm at uh, Uncle Hugo's in Minneapolis, and they say uh, an author has left a book for you. So if you want it, you know, okay. And I was like, all right. And he comes over, he's like, all right. <gasps> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what am I going to do with this? And so I'm like, I have to carry it around in my hand. So one is like, well played. <laughs> but the other thing is, it's like, because he, he signed it. And then the inside is like, Mr. Scalzi, I'm a big fan. I hope that maybe you like It's like, fuck, it's like a puppy, I guess. <laughs> in England, Pat, when, when Galance did that to me back when the Name of the Wind was new and it was only in trade paperback, they're like, well, there's this book you should bring with you. We think it's cool. It's a talk. I'm getting on a plane. They're like, you can just sit on it. <laughs> they do is they come well, over. Could you, could you put that uh, on the other side of the plane? we got to balance out the plane. <laughs> well, no, Patrick's got this shtick because I met him for the first time at a Romantic Times convention. <laughs> And he was sitting next to me and he says, Oh, I love your work so much. Fuck. <laughs> Patrick, I think, he's he must have done this to, I think I think he must have done this to every author he can get his hands on. <laughs> I thought what we had was special, Pat. Honestly, I've, I've never read any of your books. <laughs> I think it's better to get this finally off my shoulders. <laughs> I'd like to imagine everyone just keeps leaving the same copy. <laughs> Patrick, the name of the wind is like the fruitcake of books. That's a blur. Mine says, Dear Mom and Dad, thanks for everything. That's, that's pretty good, sweet, Pat. <laughs> Does that answer your question, Dan? So could we elaborate? What exactly is a Romantic Times Convention? Romantic Times Convention is awesome, actually. Yeah, I was actually just there. It happened last month in New Orleans. It's sponsored by um, Romantic Times Mag uh, Review Magazine, which is, um, it reviews books. And, um, They've, they've shortened it to RT um, now because it turns out they review everything, not just romance. And, um, and they've been really great to the science fiction and fantasy community. Yeah. Um, they have reviewed all of our books um, very, very well. And um, 
and they do this big convention every year that it was my first time and it's kind of unlike anything I've ever been at before. It's, it's awesome. Um, it's, it's thousands and thousands of, of completely rabid readers in a hotel right. for four days right. <laughs> with a bar <laughs> in New Orleans last month. It was great. Well, I have really fond of romantic times because they've given me awards. Yes. <laughs> And, there are, and the science fiction community never has. <laughs> and their award ceremony is awesome. One, because they tell you who's won in advance, so when you go, you know you're getting something, right? <laughs> so that's one thing. The other thing that's really cool, uh, a couple years ago I won a Romantic Times Award for, for Red Shirts, and uh, because most of the award winners are, are women and they're wearing heels and dresses and, and just kind of unwieldy to, 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 to go up. Um, they have these like super buff male models. They have male <laughs> models. Yes. And they, and, they, and, they, and they escort you up, right? And, and the, it's, was, beautiful. It's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful to behold. And then the thing is, is that, so I won and, and I'm like the only guy who has a lot of award there and the rest of them are women. And so what they do is, the person who wins gets walked up, the next person comes to the ramp to be, you know, so they're, they've got a system. And so the uh, person, the woman in front of me gets walked up to do her thing, and I come and I stand right there to be going. And the male models are looking at me like, what do we do with that? And I'm like, you're walking me up! I won this award and I want the full romantic time. He did it in that tone of voice. Hey, really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, and so, you know, I get named, and you know, one comes to lock me up, and the other one comes and gets me. They're like carrying me, my feet are kind of like. This is the best award ceremony ever. <laughs> What you're saying is we need to get male models. <laughs> yeah. 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 I feel like I'm suddenly on a very different panel. <laughs> we had no idea what the panel was going to be, and now we found out. <laughs> mentioned that alcohol generally makes any convention better. We do have an event called Drinks with Authors that is taking place. Uh, so so I invited to that. Saturday night. <laughs> you, you are now invited. Okay. <laughs> um, what could one potentially expect from something called Drinks with Authors? Drunk authors? <laughs> I'm just on that one. Yeah. yeah. What does one get out of a drunk author? <laughs> I am a I don't think there's much difference between John Soper and otherwise. <laughs> the, the funny thing is, is that I don't actually drink. I can get stupid on my own. John, just, John gets high on Coke Zero. This is normal. <laughs> this, this is sober in John. You don't want me drunk because I, I have a theory that there's like there are happy drunks and there's sleepy drunks and there's horny drunks and there's angry drunks. And I would be the drunk who'd be like, Sean, I know I shouldn't. Say this, and people said, don't say this to Shannon, but someone needs to say it to you, Shannon, and I'm going to be the one who says it. Shannon, and then I would say whatever it is that I thought you would say. Because you're going to beat the shit out of me. That was fine, it's fine. No, no, I am the murderer. It would be, and it would be the right, she would be right to do it. Like, she'd come my wife, and she'd either come her, her husband, and she'd be like, fair call. <laughs> She's not telling me I can't murder you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. She's like, you know, Thank you. Yeah. But that's the whole point. It's like, I know the line, because here's the line anyway. And I'm just me going right up to the line. And I'm completely sober. If I'm drunk, I'm going to get the crap beat out of me oh, yeah. in three minutes. I would introduce you to your spleen. Yeah. It's <laughs> actually pretty amazing. There was a Hugo for least murder sensitive spouse, <laughs> Christy Scalzi, 23 years in a row. <laughs> It's a weird thing. I mean, you know, when people walk into the room, we say, hi, John, we talk about murdering him. Well, Mark, you know, it's just a recurring thing around here. You know, and part of the reason that I'm comfortable with it is that Chrissy would kick the shit out of well, yeah. <laughs> You see the calculations behind her eyes. Yeah, you know, she's so like, it is not yet time. She's, <laughs> when our daughter was born, 
Um, and it was amazing because just the switch from uh, into mama bear. Like if anybody ever did anything with her child, she would be like, oh, here's your heart. <laughs> <laughs> now they would go. And it wouldn't matter who they were. It's just like, she, and she would find them and she would like see, you know, you, and she would make sure that they saw her coming from a long way away, so that they would have time to think about what they had done before she got there. It's like, and she goes, you're going to die now. Like, yeah, yeah, I know. Whereas my mother had me come home at six and inform her that I had found my career and she's like, really? Where'd you find it? I found it in a book. What's the book called, honey? Village of the Damned. <laughs> Mom just accepted that one day she'd be viewing me from the front row in the electric chair room. <laughs> yes, that's coming. So, anyway, that's why I don't drink. <laughs> I was at in the bed once and um, drinking, and I looked up at one point and noticed there was a chair of people just watching me because apparently I am an amusing drunk. <laughs> I, I am an entertaining drunk. Um, show tunes have been involved, <laughs> um, which, which is, you know. Everyone's happy I'm drunk and everyone gets to your show tune. So, I think it's great. So what we're saying is two martinis and then we just let it go? <laughs> oh, you know, I, I've only seen it once, so I don't, I have to hear it a couple more times before I have that one. But I do West Side Story, I do Guys and Dolls, uh, Into the Woods. I can, so, yeah. I don't want Sancho. The English are singing Dream the Impossible Dream. We had been reading Tennyson, and he's got one of these poems that's like, oh, you know, to the Ulysses, you know, seeking, sailing beyond. And I just, from the back of the classroom, just started singing this. And the teacher took me aside after. This was not the first time I had sung in English. In English class. <laughs> Did you know you can't sing every Emily Dickinson poem in the tune of Yellow Rose of Texas? I, I pointed this out. It gave English. And the teacher finally took me aside and said, no more singing, Carrie. <laughs> I didn't like that teacher at all. <laughs> I will say, um, actually, I'm with John. I don't drink, generally speaking. I've got about four inhibitions, and they're all working real hard. <laughs> <laughs> they're really important. And uh, But that said, somebody gave me like a stone bottle of Danish mead at my signing last night. And, and it's sort of like the book thing, where it's like, ah, this... He like brought this from Daneland or where. <laughs> <laughs> You're an educated man. <laughs> and uh, and I'm like, I can't just like leave it at the bookstore. You know, it's like I kind of have to try this now. Uh, but you know, the other thing is like I will sing without the influence of drinking. So uh, that's probably what you'll see is me with this stone bottle of, of Viking mead, <laughs> sharing it around with people and having a rare, a rare drink. I can't tell you what's going to happen. <laughs> what actually, Pat, uh, you, you bring up what I think is a really interesting topic, which is the whole thing of people like giving you stuff when you're where on tour and you're like, what do I do with this? I carved every character in your book from Driftwood I've been collecting for 16 years. <laughs> I mean, love this, but you, you used a Jeep to get it here. Yeah. <laughs> right, whereas we're on a plane and the next yeah. day. The thing that I had recently, because was people started bringing me buttercream frosting. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I made, I made this joke when I got up to uh, come down on 30,000 Twitter followers that if I got to 30,000 Twitter followers, I would strip naked and cover myself in buttercream frosting. And I didn't really think of it, ha 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 ha, it's a joke. And yeah. fucking Neil Gaiman retweeted it. <laughs> and, and then one, you know, getting closer and closer and closer to 30,000, I retweet him, I'm like, I'm like, Neil, you bastard, if this happens, I'm doing it in your front lawn. <laughs> Supposed to frighten him off, and he, of course, Neil goes, that would be lovely. <laughs> so, this did actually happen. I mean, on Neil's front lawn, he covered in, in buttercream fossil, and there's a picture out there. <laughs> Believe me, there's a picture out there. <laughs> but in the interim, I had a book tour, 
uh, for red shirts, and people just like, here's your can of buttercream frosting. I hope that, that will be of service to you. In, in Minneapolis, where apparently, you know, the, the capital of people giving authors wear chet, a guy came with like a 10 pound tub of homemade buttercream frosting. And I'm like, 10 pounds, what did you expect me to do with this? He says, practice. Which is really ironic because as much as I do drink, I don't drink beer. <laughs> so I get all this beer and it's, like, it's lined up on my shelf for when people come over. <laughs> well, compared to all of these people, I'm really boring. Um, I don't drink, but it's not because of moral scruples. I'm one of those very rare people who is physically allergic to alcohol, which I, which I found out. <laughs> I found, out as, I found out as a Navy pilot trying to be one of those macho types and almost ended up in the emergency room because I'd been a competitive swimmer all the way through college, which meant that I wasn't drinking. Then I got in the Navy and said, I can drink. No. <laughs> uh, so I don't get any of that sort of stuff. The only thing I've really gotten that was sort of neat was, um, those of you who have heard about my saga of Recluse, the main character in the first book, has a black staff and a woodworker in my town actually created from scratch a black wow. sycamore stack staff bound in iron and inscribed with the first lines. Oh, wow. That's awesome. That's that's awesome. That, see, so that just doesn't deserve to be mentioned in the same way. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just like the kind of man practice stuff, I get frosty. <laughs> I think I wasn't allowed to keep. Someone brought me a 16-foot leochistic Burmese python. And that was great, except for the part where then they wanted the snake back. <laughs> what, what, did you even, what did you even bring it if you're not going to let me keep it? Right? Right. You, to be fair, difficult to get on a plane. I found a way. I hear there is a film that is a documentary of how to do it. I seem to remember that one. Has it has anybody, I figure Pat has, and I figure you probably have, and I got my first one of these and I was so happy. Dude putting a tattoo of something related to the book, he put the cover, you know, the hardcover uh, picture of Old Man's War, like, on his arm. Why don't we let him do that? I mean, that's great job. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I haven't had that, but I've had a number of people ask if they could name their kids after characters in my books. Wow. First baby this year, someone named their kid Locke, that poor, poor child. <laughs> now, this is a thing for many, many years because George actually had a gigantic gallery on his old website of literally dozens of children. And, and the funny part is that these kids were named, you know, Arya and Bran and Brad, 12 years ago, long before everybody found out what happens to this whole family. <laughs> In it, like one of the most, uh, like in the last year, one of the most popular upward trending names for, for girls, Khaleesi. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
and I, I would get pictures from people saying, yeah, we named a kitten after one of your characters. And that, that's awesome, that's really cool, but it's not a wall of baby pictures. So finally, someone got crazy and sleep deprived enough to say, this kid looks like a Loch Lamora to me. I'm sorry, kid, wherever you are. There's a thievery ahead. I, so. I, I mean, that would be terrible. <laughs> You know, I don't know why you guys are complaining. I've had one gift ever. It came from Romania, and it was my head cut off in six pictures. I, I, put put I on, got put, some on put on underwear here. commercials. That's the only thing I've ever gotten. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of oil. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a restraining order. <laughs> well, I mean, he's from Romania, so I'm cutting some slack. He's from Pennsylvania. Yeah, from Pennsylvania. Yeah. No. Well, anyway, okay, I've never felt like proud to say this before, but I do drink. Um, <laughs> um, I tend to karaoke when I drink, and usually it's pretty embarrassing, but since I have a member of Hanson up here with me... <laughs> Song. What is your your drunken go to karaoke song? There's one. Mm Bob. <laughs> is that the one you actually sing? Oh uh, no, uh, Walking in Memphis. I tried and I lose myself halfway through. Yeah. 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 Or Baxter Boys. Any, anybody else? What's your what's your drunken karaoke song? I'm, I'm looking well, at you. I actually me. now could do Let It Go because my I have a three and a half year old. Oh, her version. Um, yeah. Her version of it just seems to be Let It Go. Let It Go. Let It Go. <laughs> Well, so, you know, I can do that. since I don't do drunken, but I also don't do singing, I sing so badly that when I tried to sing my youngest daughter lullabies many years ago, she cried. <laughs> I could hum, but she wouldn't let me sing. <laughs> now, it may be that she grew up to be a musician and I was just not up to her standards, but... I mostly do when you're good to mama. It gets me lots of drinks at the karaoke bar down the street. There you go. The first night I was ever drunk in my entire life, I blame the publishing industry. I didn't get drunk until I was 26. It was the party to celebrate the sale of my first novel. Um, and it was the party to propose to my now ex-wife. So the first night I got drunk in my entire life, I proposed to my now ex-wife. So that's my drunk story. <laughs> and that's why you never want to be drunk again? We, we got better. I don't know how anybody tops that. <laughs> Do you actually want that drug story to opt? <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay. So I, I did not finish my college degree initially. I ran out of money. And my professors were very sorry, so they opened a tab for me and my friends at the local bar, which is called Spats. The last thing I remember of that night was taking on a scorpion for two by myself. That's a rum punch that comes in a punch bowl. I was drinking it with both hands, and then I passed out. Which is when Cindy and Angel decided they were going to win the prank war that we had had going for the previous six years. It took me, Alric, and Dominic, and loaded us into the back of Cindy's truck and drove us down to the train yard. Loaded us into the back of a train bound for Portland. <laughs> Figured we'd wake up when the train started to move. Spoiler alert, no. So we woke up as we were pulling out of Portland. <laughs> Shoes. Dominic has no ID, Alric has no pants. <laughs> Dominic does have a bottle of vodka. We decide that clearly the answer to our situation is to drink the bottle of vodka. Because when we wake up, we'll be back in the bay area. <laughs> it turns out trains don't work that way. <laughs> so the train keeps going. And we wake up again when we hit our final destination. And we are now you know, three seriously drunk, hungover, vaguely alcohol-poisoned college students with a big bottle of vodka. So we get off the train and we're like, where? Why is that sign in French? Where are Vancouver? So we've now illegally entered Canada. While underage. While drunk. I do not have pictures. I am very sorry. This was before the era of the easy access cellular phone. But if you get a Vancouver phone book, you can find that Kwong's hot air balloons is still in operation. Because none of us had passports. But Alric's uncle had a hot air balloon business that specialized in in-air weddings. So you could get married on the border between Canada and the United States. So he loaded us into a hot air balloon. <laughs> 
when we come together, I take 80% of my brain and devote it to not freaking out. <laughs> and so I look like I've been pissed, but I don't embarrass myself in front of them, right? <laughs> and that's the important thing. Uh, and the one year, he did a 10-year anniversary of uh, the release of American Gods mm -hmm. at House on the Rock. And that's in Wisconsin, and I live in Wisconsin, and of course I'm kind of stalking Gaiman, so of course I find out <laughs> about this event. As we all are. And, uh, and so I'm like, that's cool. I, I, I'm like, let's go. So I sign up, I get on a few panels, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to get to see Neil Gaiman at this thing, and I get to go to House on the Rock. And I go, I have a good time, I'm relaxing, I've just been through deadline hell, so I'm kind of a mess mentally. And I run through in my head, what will I do if I'm actually going to get to talk to him? Because you script those things, right? You know what I'm talking about? You're know, like, what would I say? Oh, God, no, these are the things I can't say. This is, you know, and you kind of get, come up with contingency plans. And so I'm, I'm prepped as much as I can be. And the first night goes by, and I watch him do some stuff, and it's fine. 
And then we go to the hotel and they have a breakfast buffet. I wake up. I, I'm just going to talk for 15 minutes. I'll never meet Damon in this story because of all of the videos. <laughs> We're going to the breakfast buffet. I'm not a morning person. Go out and somebody comes up on my blind side with their hand out. And Gaiman and our, our readerships overlap, so people have been introducing themselves as Wayal Khan. And so I, I turn around and I'm like, hey, and halfway through shaking the hand, it's Gaiman. <laughs> and this is like four years ago, just for some temporal context. I've actually have gotten to know Gaiman better, and I'm marginally okay with it now. <laughs> but he comes up and he's like, I didn't know you were going to be here, and I'm doing a signing in your panel. And I'm like, there's nothing that I can say that you don't already know. And because it's come out of nowhere and I'm not ready for it, I'm just like a regular person, and he's a regular person. Which, by the way, is the good way to handle it. Just, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. just be people. It's, it's cool. Don't worry about it. But when you, it, it's the person you're a geek for, it's hard to remember that. And so we're talking, and I have like five minutes of human conversation with Gaiman. Don't freak out. I don't have to devote most of my brain to not having a spasm. <laughs> and then his assistant kind of says, you're holding up the buffet line. So we turn, and in the act of picking up my plate, and it frees up enough of my brain to go, Neil Gaiman's right there, right there. And so I start to have a huge, huge freak out about how I am loading my plate at the buffet. I mean, like, a real legitimate, like, paralyzing fear freak out. Like, and I'm like, and I'm like, is this a really fucked up amount of scrambled egg to get? Like, is, this a, is this a really abnormal amount of scrambled egg? Is, do I get three sausages? Is that like a gross number of sausages? <laughs> what is Damon going to think of me? That's so why I, I tough it out, right? I make it through the line with him behind me. And all the time I'm like, you're crazy, Rob. This Damon doesn't care how much scrambled egg. But at the same time, I walk back feeling dumb and crushed. And like, like, oh. Like, he was going to go back to his table and tell his friends. Like, I just ran into Patrick Rothfuss. Dude is a freak for scrambled egg. Uh, uh, there's, there's my shameful geek story. It might be the wrong place to, to say this, but uh, I was over at Neil's house not too long ago. <laughs> uh, I, came across, I came across his scrambled egg diary. <laughs> The things he, did, he says about you in that, I just don't... Uh... You, you have at least, Pat, succeeded very convincingly in becoming a Neil Gaiman character. <laughs> well, yeah, well, because the, the narration you just gave us is right out of a Neil Gaiman <laughs> uh, the, the story that, that I have is uh, my very first novel signing is at Boss Cone in 2005. And the thing that they like to do is that you have your signing session with another writer. Um, so my book has been out for two weeks, like two or three weeks at this point. Um, and so I thought, you know, they'll give me, me and some other first time author, we'll have stories to tell, isn't this so exciting? Um, and the, 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 the writer that they gave me to sign against was George Martin. <laughs> so I've got one person in my line who's a guy that I went to high school with. <laughs> George Martin's line goes out and around and around and out and out and around to Rhode Island. <laughs> and so, but I'm being introduced to him for the very first time, and I'm like, George Martin, I'm so glad to meet you. I love your books. Because one time in my office, there was a spider that was as big as mine. <laughs> And I didn't want to try to touch it, so I picked up this book of yours. <laughs> it worked like a charm. <laughs> and he looked at me like I was some kind of asshole. <laughs> so, but the good news is that later on I got to 
to know him. He's a perfectly nice guy. And, uh, and he holds and, and, grudges for like 16, 17 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, the nice thing is, is that at the 2011 uh, Worldcon, he had a, he married his longtime uh, a, a partner, Paris, and so he had a, a wedding reception, and he invited me to it. And it was only after I was leaving in the cab, I was like, "Oh shit, that was a, a George Martin wedding." <laughs> <laughs> Blocked by Mercedes Lackey. Um, but it's okay. The, the first, the, the, my my first year of publication. I got a book out. Look, I'm special now. No, 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 you're not. Um, I was on the most wonderful panel I've ever been on in my favorite convention on earth. Uh, after Phoenix Comic Con. And uh, it was it was great. It was scintillating. It was great people on it. They were all wonderful. And five of us performed this panel for three people, one of whom was my fiance, and one of whom was my housemate, and one of whom worked for the convention. Because what had happened was the Mercedes Lackey signing had been put right outside the door. So her line blocked the door and went to the parking lot. And everyone in Minnesota is there, like my own grandparents. You know, I remember in life from Mercedes Lackey. Are you here too? <laughs> Grandma. Um, the woman blocks the door. We have a wonderful panel. Ten minutes into it, the person from the convention looks around and they do that sort of half motion, like slow walk thing. Literally, like pantomime ninja. Because apparently authors can't see you when you move in half <laughs> it and, and they take like two minutes to like Pink Panther their way out the door through the Mercedes Lackey sign, and it's like, we, we can see you, you are visible! <laughs> I, I felt really bad about this for a couple of years, but then I eventually realized that, you know, if you go to a convention and you sit around having a wonderful conversation with seven people, uh, this is not a failure mode of anything, it's just a wonderful conversation. Right. Um, and I later got to finally meet uh, Mercedes Lackey properly, and she saved my ass, and she's a wonderful sweetheart, and uh, I can't say anything bad about her. You, you know that the rule is that if there are more people on the panel than there are in the audience, you all adjourn to the bar, right? <laughs> this is a, a very good rule. By the way, Phil Clay, you left, uh, and I dissed you, and you weren't here, so it wasn't humorous, it was just embarrassing, so thank you. <laughs> Screw you, Scott. <laughs> Restored. <laughs> and, and just to backtrack a tiny little bit, because I have to tell, um, these things move in cycles, and I don't know if you've heard George tell the story of one of his early signings, where he was signing against Stephen King. <laughs> and this is before Game of Thrones, this is before any of that, so you know, he was like the rest of us, kind of, you know, the journeyman, workman, science fiction, fantasy author. And he's doing the signing with Stephen King, and he has zero people in his line at that point. And Stephen King's got the line going out and around. And apparently some kind person um, at running this signing thought it would be um, generous to, to maybe walk up and down the line and make sure there was nobody in the Stephen King line who really wanted to sign your charge. And so this person walked up and down saying, no, no line for George R.R. R. Martin. No no one waiting for George. And just, yeah, so so that's the story that George tells. Well, he, actually, he actually had a signing with minus people. He, yeah. He, he yeah. was very early on in his career, he was sitting at this cafe signing, and he was at the table waiting, and there were three people in the cafe table, and they announced that, well, now George R. R. Martin will read from his novel, and the three people get up. And read. <laughs> so, and, and what this is known as is the great circle of authorship. <laughs> is that everybody, it doesn't matter how successful they are, how popular they are now, everybody has a story like that. I, I had a sign in Costco, where that was just, that was just, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> did, did they bring you free samples? <laughs> and here's 10 pounds of cream frost. <laughs> It was before I started writing novels, it was the book I wrote called The Book of the Dumb, which was stupid people doing stupid things. And they were like, and the distributor mostly sold those books in bulk at Costco, right? Not like you would buy ten of them, but you know, they would like put this huge pallet of them, boom, there you go. They're like, you should go to the Costco and sign. So they set me up, like right next to the pallet, and people would walk in and they would just be like, 
you know. What would you do? I'm, I'm digging this imagery. Like a pal, just, it's a stick of books. You just rip off however many. <laughs> yeah, you got six. You, know, you got six. You can give them to every member of your family. It's gonna be fun. I wrote the book of the dumb, right? And it saved my life once because there was one time there's a light and the light went out and I needed to replace the light. So I'm a small man, I'm like five. Five scalzi, five And so I get on a chair and but I can't, and it's still not quite tall. Enough. So I'm like, fine. And I get another chair and I put it on that chair. And I'm beginning to climb up the chairs and then in my brain, Book of the Dumb author dies stupidly. <laughs> I walk down from the chair. I gotta wait for my wife to get home because she's five foot eleven. She's like. Oh. <laughs> when you're doing a sign, it is true. She's five. She is. Uh, but when you're doing a sign at a place like Costco or, or back when we still have the borders, you become invisible. If, if people don't want to buy your book, they're afraid that if they make eye contact, right. they have to. You will force yes. it upon them. Yes. So I had a signing at a Borders one day where it was it was just after Rosemary and Rude came out. Nobody knew who the hell I was. I also hung out at that Borders a lot, so it looked kind of like the weird chick that just liked to read the comic book section and somehow found a table. <laughs> so no one will look me in the eye. They're just like scum, scum, scum. But my table was right next to the comic book section. So I read my way through the entire new releases rack. One, and I look up and smile and scum, scum, scum. So we finish, and I go up and I'm like, I'm done. I've been here for three hours. I signed a book, I didn't even write it. <laughs> I said, sure, you can leave. But I'm still feeling kind of invisible. We got to the car, the car won't start. And everyone that's walking through the parking garage is someone who has just failed to make eye contact with me in borders and are still afraid to look at me. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had to go and flag down a trucker. <laughs> so, clearly, the solution to this is to actually, when they come up to the, to the actual uh, checkout, they go, oh, you know the author left a book signed for you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, how you that's how you saw all those books. Dear Bob, dear Jane, dear Sue. <laughs> I'm, I'm really an admirer of the way that you uh, do that accounting thing you do. Thanks for not making eye contest. Right. <laughs> The military is trying to harness this technology for stealth, yeah. you know? Like author desperation. They're just going to scrap first-time authors to all their jets. <laughs> <laughs> ah, look! Ah, they're shooting at us, but at least they didn't try to sell us a book. That's just a sidewinder missile, not the first book in a trilogy. <laughs> I'm going to talk about missiles. I'll throw in my little story about being upstage. I just, it'd been a couple of years after the first Reckless book came out, and I was doing a signing in conjunction with the World Fantasy Convention in London, and I was signing with somebody else. I'd never heard of this lady before. Her name was J.V. Jones, otherwise known as Julie Jones. Now, Julie's not too active these days, but Julie Jones, especially then, looked like the movie star's movie star blonde bombshell. She was absolutely gorgeous. And I'm sitting next to her on this forbidden planet, and people come up, I get a quick glance, and everybody goes to Julie's table. <laughs> and they keep going to Julie's table. And they keep going to Julie's table. And occasionally somebody comes up, and finally this well-dressed fellow comes up and says, I really like all your books. And I say, would you like me to sign one for you? And he says, no, I don't care for you, I just like your books. <laughs> wow. Sorcerers. And it's a three-book 
followed by two books that take place 30 years later about the main character in the first book's foster daughter, and in the fourth book, the second one, Anna, who was the character in the first one, dies of old age. I get a, an email from a Barnes & Noble employee said, I thought you'd like to hear about this. And when a, a bookstore sends you something like this, you immediately wince. You know it's not going to be good. And it says, I just want you to know that when a copy of The Shadow Sorceress came back, came, when Shadow Sorceress came back, I had a customer who came in, and she looked at me and she said, she held up the book and she said, he shouldn't have done this, and she threw the book at me. <laughs> Let's be nice to the authors and not throw things at more books. So, and which drinks with authors? Drinks with authors is... Saturday. Is that it? 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 Okay, so we don't have a train, but we do have a light rail. So, it could be a thing potentially. I don't black out drink anymore.